Well, hopefully I'll be able to show to you that it's not that scary, um, only from an engineering perspective. Um, but first of all, can I apologise for baiting everyone from going to stage A this morning. Um, on my way up this morning, I had a flat tyre um, on just about getting onto the motorway. Um, uh, so can I please have a, a shout out and, and a round of applause for my friend Rob who rescued me and the, and the kind person who lent him an impact wrench to, to help me out as well. Um, it was a bit touch and go. So, um, first of all, who am I? Um, I'm just a systems engineer. That generally means that I know a little bit about a fair few things. I'm not um, a, an expert in fusion science. I'm not a plasma physicist, but I am, on a day-to-day -day basis, surrounded by people who are um, experts in their field, like people who are the best in the world. Um, I'm employed at the UK Atomic Energy Authority, um, which uh, you might think, oh, that's so entirely to do with nuclear power. It's not. It's only to do with fusion. It's nothing to do with fission. Um, so the UK AEA runs the UK National Fusion Research Programme, and that's based in Cullum in the UK. Um, uh, I've previously worked at Dyson and Kinetic, um, and this presentation has not been officially sanctioned by the UK AEA or fusion community or anything like that. This is just my personal take as uh, an engineer who happens to be working in the fusion field. Um, this is a general overview of what we're going to go through, so I'm going to be talking about fusion basics um, and then talking about why don't we have fusion yet and then start talking about some of the gnarly technical challenges that we uh, encounter in the fusion world um, and then some interesting news about what we're actually doing about fusion, what's the latest state of the art. Um, what I'm not going to be covering is um, the politics and the alternative power sources bit, that's a whole different conversation. Um, bottom line is, I think we'll need a mix. We'll always need a mix, as we always have done in the past. Sustainable power is good. Um, so, what is fusion? I'm wary that I'm already starting out with a graph. Um, so, uh, fusion generally works by um, splitting heavy elements like uranium and plutonium. Um, and they tend to produce a lot of highly radioactive byproducts. Um, the way this works is that um, we're effectively harnessing the power of the strong force, which is the force that binds uh, atomic nuclei together, all the, all the protons and neutrons. Um, and this graph shows the amount of basically potential energy you get from the strong force. And, and in the middle here, we have um, uh, iron and, and nickel are the most stable, and anything you do to form uh, elements that are closer to that, you effectively gain energy. So what fission does is it takes re those really heavy elements and moves off to towards the uh, area of stability to get that energy. What fission, what fusion does is the exact opposite. So we take the very light elements such as helium uh, and hydrogen, combine them together um, uh, to make heavier elements, and that's how we get our energy. So it's the exact opposite. But you can see from this graph that there's a huge difference in potential energy between, um, you know, if, if you look at the difference that you get from splitting the heavy elements, it's only that so sort of that relatively small amount. Whereas if you look at the difference between hydrogen and heavier elements such as uh, helium and, and, and so on, it's it's, it's orders, no, it's about, probably about five times more, something like that. Um, and the other advantage is that uh, it's, it's the, uh, the byproducts are stable and inert. So if you, for example, combine uh, hydrogen together and get helium, helium's pretty inert, that's pretty safe, so you don't have any issues with the uh, byproducts that come from it. Um, so where does this energy actually come from? So. Um, one of the things in order, you need to do in order to um, get this energy is combine the atomic nuclei together. So um, if you imagine uh, you've got protons, they naturally repel because they're positively charged. Um, so if you could only get them close enough together, uh, the strong force only acts on very uh, short um, length scales. So if you get them close together, they sort of snap together almost like magnets. But they, at longer distances, they repel. So you need to apply some kind of force to be able to get them together, and then suddenly you'll get all this energy out. Um, so one of the obvious questions that tends to come from this is, OK, so why not just use a particle accelerator to smash them together? We do that all the time. And in, in, indeed, we do. We do do fusion in this way in experiments. However, that's extremely inefficient. Um, when you try and do this, when you try and smash protons together, you have much less than 1% chance of them actually uh, combining. What tends to happen is they tend to deflect uh, away from each other and they hit the walls of your particle accelerator and so on. So it's, it's just a, a really inefficient way of doing it. So you can't really have much prospect of getting net energy out. 
Um, this is trying to illustrate again how much energy you can get out of it. So uh, what happens is if you take, for example, two, two protons and two neutrons um, and you measure the weight of them, for some reason they are, heavy, they are heavier than if you combine them together into uh, one nucleus. Um, and that reason is that, that difference in mass is called the mass defect and that comes from uh, literally the binding energy. So um, this is Einstein's famous equals mc squared equation. Um, you can see that there's an enormous exchange rate there, which is the, the speed of light squared. So what happens is you actually get a huge amount of energy from a relatively small amount of mass difference. Um, and, and literally what we're doing here is converting mass into energy. Um, so what does the sun use? Uh, so mostly the sun is comprised of uh, protons. Um, and when these protons combine, they will form other isotopes. So um, uh, an isotope uh, basically has the same number of protons, but additional neutrons. So the different isotopes of hydrogen that we typically think about in stellar fuel um, is protium, where you've only got the proton, deuterium, where you've got one extra neutron, and tritium, where you've got a, a third neutron. I'm explaining this because this is going to be important for the fueling part that I get onto later on. And then helium um, is uh, ultimately the, the product that you get uh, at the end of a lot of fusion reactions in stars. Um, so this is the actual process, well, this is one of the processes the sun uses. Um, there are many, many processes that it uses. Nuclear, uh, nuclear fusion is, can be complex. Um, but what it typically starts off with is uh, protons um, in the core of the sun. So the sun tends to have most of the uh, fusion reactions occurring in its very core, about 15 million degrees Celsius. Um, it turns out, actually, this is pretty cold for fusion. So um, each proton it, at this temperature takes about 9 billion years on average to fuse in a, into a deuteron, which is the uh, into deuterium. Um, then once that happens, though, after that 9 billion years, uh, it takes about one second-ish to fuse further into a, a triton or tritium, uh, and then about 400 years-ish to fuse again into ultimately helium. Um, so that entire process takes billions of years, um, which is exactly why um, the power is actually a pretty awful uh, power source. Um, the only reason it's so powerful to us is because it's so massive. Um, the power density is actually roughly comparable to a uh, pile of compost. Um, it's on the same order of magnitude as humans as well. Um, so it's not very practical if we want to try and harness, literally harness the power of the sun on Earth. So how do we do it? So um, we, have, we want a really much higher reaction rate than the sun uh, in order to get useful power out in our lifetime. So, we do two things. We use much higher temperatures. So we use, typically in, in fusion reactors, about 10 times hotter than the center of the sun. So about 150 million degrees Celsius. Um, and we use much more reactive fuel. So uh, that graph on the right-hand side is effectively a graph of reactivity or, 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 neutron, or, or uh, nuclear cross-section. That means, basically, if you, fire, if, if you try and combine two uh, uh, nuclei, uh, this shows you roughly the, the probability you, you will get um, uh, an interaction to occur. Uh, and it shows that you know, proton protons is way off to the, the right-hand side. I wouldn't have a you know, page big enough. Um, but deuterium-tritium reactions are by far the most likely at the lowest temperatures. Um, and you'll notice you know, there are other kinds of, you know, there are kinds of reactors and, and people talking on the news sometimes about, for example, proton-boron reactions um, and deuterium-helium-3. Um, the, the problem with these typically is that because this is the log graph, they are orders of magnitude more difficult to achieve. You need to have temperatures even hotter than what we use, you know, 10 times hotter than what we use in, in, in fusion reactions, in nuclear um, uh, reactors, um, which itself is 10 times hotter than the center of the sun. So it becomes incredibly difficult to be able to do that. Um, the, uh, the other thing that's probably worth uh, mentioning is the, uh, the, the fuel cycle that we use. So what we, we start with is deuterium and tritium, um, and we get out helium and a neutron. And the, uh, the helium we can use to heat the rest of the fuel, so it's self-sustaining. And the neutron uh, we can use to also absorb into other um, materials. So we basically block it with some kind of uh, you know, wall or something like that, and that absorbs the heat. And then we can use that heat to generate, turbine, uh, generate power from turbines and so on. Um, 
One of the issues with this is that tritium is very rare. So deuterium, that's relatively abundant. That's in the seawater. We can get that, an almost unlimited supply of that. Um, the, the issue is tritium because that has a half-life of about 12.3 years. Um, so that does occur naturally sort of in the high atmosphere due to uh, cosmic rays. But it's very difficult uh, to get access to that. Um, so in the world uh, supply, we only have a few kilograms of, of uh, tritium available. Um, and that comes from as, as like sort of byproduct of nuclear fission reactors. Um, so what we do instead is we take that neutron, we um, fire that into lithium, we absorb that into lithium-6, and that naturally produces tritium as a, as a result. So what we, what we do is we feed that tritium back into the fuel cycle. So what we end up doing is putting in um, deuterium and getting out helium, uh, no, deuterium and lithium and getting out helium as a result. Um, so in terms of energy density, this is quite interesting. This is one of the reasons why this is so tempting. Um, uh, a one gram deuterium uh, tritium pellet has about 340 gigajoules of energy in it. Um, that's roughly equivalent to about 55 barrels of oil, about 2,400 gallons. Um, so the energy density is absolutely enormous um, as long as you can harness it. Um, another uh, analogy for this is that um, if you take a bathtub of seawater um, and filter out the deuterium from that, and you go and get a couple of ba laptop batteries worth of lithium, that's about enough to cover a person's entire lifetime's ne energy needs. Um, and so when we talk about unlimited power, this is effectively what we mean when we're talking infusion. Um, so how do we make the fusion reactions happen on Earth? Um, well, naturally, when we have these fuel particles um, and we try and combine them, they're just sort of floating, floating around. You know. At the temperatures that we're talking about, you know, 150-ish million degrees, they just sort of randomly fly around. And if you don't try and contain them, then they will just escape and dissipate. So what you want to do is you want to squeeze them together as much as possible, make them as hot as possible, and keep them there for as long as possible to maximize the chances of, of reactions. Um, and this is what we call the fusion triple product. So density times temperature times confinement time is what you typically sort of think about when you're talking about um, how well a fusion reactor might work in comparison to another one. It's not a strict product that we use as a value, but it's useful for comparisons. Um, so we need to confine this extremely hot, uh, hot plasma because at these temperatures you can only basically have a plasma and by the way a plasma is when you take any um, atom and you heat it to such a degree um, that the electron escapes from the, nucle uh, the, the nucleus. So um, if we look at our platter of potential forces in the universe that we can use to try and contain it, because we can't just put it into a bottle because the bottle will immediately vaporize, and worse, it'll cool your fuel, which is not what you want. So um, you could use gravity, and that's literally what the sun uses. So that just sits there. If you get enough of pretty much any material, to be honest, it'll start fusing. Um, so, so we could do that, but that's probably impractical. We haven't got enough of that material except for the sun. Um, we could use magnetic fields, um, which, are, which turned out to be a very good option because plasmas, because they, um, we separated the electrons and the protons, they are charged, so they react well. They, they can, are controllable by magnetic fields. Um, we can use inertia, so a lot of uh, projects use inertia, which is basically you try and get the reaction to happen so quickly um, and so violently that the particles don't have a chance to escape in time before your reactions have already occurred. Um, or, or some people talk about electrostatics. Um, and uh, be very wary when anyone talks about trying to use electrostatics for, for fusion because it, it, it's not, I don't know if it's been proven, but it's, it's uh, been pro proven through time certainly that um, it's a very inefficient way of generating that power. Um, so be careful of those kind of claims in, in my opinion. Um, so typically what we, the, the most, by far the most successful kind of an, an advanced mechanism for containing plasmas is magnetic confinement. Um, so the way magnetic confinement works is, um, if you think about the, you probably all learned this in school, the right-hand rule, um, the Lorentz force is what dictates how charged particles behave in uh, magnetic fields. Um, it turns out that the, the charged particles, if you try and move them perpendicular to a field, they'll be pushed sideways. And so what they do is they end up orbiting or, or circling around uh, the, the magnetic field lines. Um, but when, it's par when they're traveling parallel to magnetic field lines, they effectively are frictionless. Um, so it's kind of like they stick to magnetic field lines like train tracks. 
um, and they, they sort of spiral around them. So as long as you can form a magnetic field in the shape that you want, you can basically get your plasma to conform to that shape. So you can, you can shape your plasma. It's a really good way of controlling it. Um, so here's an example on the right-hand side. is a, like a solenoid. Um, this is like an island filings thing, but it shows the, the field lines being uniform in the middle, and that's roughly how your, your plasma might behave uh, in, in a solenoid. The issue with trying to use this kind of mechanism for containing plasmas, and people have tried, is that you've got gaps at the ends. Um, so your plasma just sort of escapes out the sides. Um, however, what if you took that solenoid and you wrapped it around so that the ends were joined, and you didn't have any ends so for, for the plasma to escape? Uh, and that's literally what we do. Uh, and that kind of design is called a tokamak. Um, so this is... This is the fundamental idea for a lot of the most successful uh, fusion reactors in the world. Um, uh, and I'll go into a little bit more, bit more detail on that because it's not quite that simple. Because if you twist those, uh, those ends together, what you end up with is a, is a non-uniform magnetic field where it was uniform before. Because you've, if, if you look at the, the shape of it uh, and the spacing of the magnets, there's less, um, there's this lesser field on the outside versus the inside. So what happens is uh, that as, as the protons or electrons are spiraling around the magnetic field, field lines, they'll tend to drift. Um, and so what we do is instead we, we put a current through the plasma itself, because that can act as a conductor, that provides a rotating magnetic field and combined with the, uh, the, ploid, the, the field um, from the TF coils, you can get um, a twisting uh, effect around the donut shape and that means that your, uh, any drift that you get is basically corrected as it comes around again. Um, so you get much better confinement if you put this um, twist in it. And the way we do this is we have a giant, basically a giant solenoid down the middle of the donut, and we apply a changing, uh, changing, electric, uh, changing current to that, and that, much like a transformer, that induces an electric current in the plasma itself. Um, the other effect of doing this is that the current will heat the plasma through resistive heating. So it has this double effect of both heating and confining your plasma. And that's one of the reasons why tokamaks are so effective. So if we know how to do fusion, and it's that simple, you just build a tokamak, then why, why is it always 20 years away, and why haven't we done it yet? Well, okay, here's a graph. Um, so, so in the 70s, the US government performed a study to examine the potential for fusion funding. Um, and uh, if you look at this graph, you can see that you know, fusion, they said fusion might be achieved in 20 years, this is back in 1976, um, with a high amount of funding. Um, still in the single digit billions, which is actually pretty small in, in the energy uh, market. Um, in 30 years, with moderate funding, um, and here is the graph of uh, about 1 billion. If you spend this, nothing happens. And the black line is what we actually spent. Um, so, yeah, okay, so it's always 20 years away, but you kind of have to want it, right? Um, uh, so, if you think about the amount that we're, we're currently spending, um, which today, uh, uh, so last year I looked it up, uh, Fusion Industry Association said we spent about, globally, about 1.4 billion. Um, so we're just above the line, we're making good progress. Um, but you compare that to what oil and gas, for example, only spend on gas and oil exploration. This is minuscule. So when people say, you know, oh, why are we funding? We're wasting all this money on this. Are we really? You know, it feels like it's worth a punt for the pittance that we're spending on it. <clears throat> so despite all of this, we have made enormous progress over the years. So um, for a long time, uh, so the, jet, the joint European Taurus um, operating in the UK was the most capable fusion machine in the world. So it was a huge collaborative effort uh, between nations starting in the 70s. Um, its history is fascinating, but I'm not going to go into that because I've got time. Um, but it resulted basically from collaboration with the Soviets during the Cold War. So you can see you know, how enormously um, sort of controversial that might seem. But there was such a collaborative um, view on fusion in the world that it was seen as important enough to be able to, you know, for the Soviets and for us to collaborate at the time. Um, the, since then, the UK has arguably been the global hub, so we were really lucky because it's an international effort, and we were chosen to host this, uh, this pioneering project. Um, so since then, we've effectively been the global hub for fusion as a result of that, but the re uh, reactor was retired last year after achieving numerous records. Um, uh, you can see from here, uh, probably it's, it's too low for, for you to see, but um, we're achieving you know, plasma stability over a time period of seconds where instabilities occur on milliseconds. So this is, you know, this is a real achievement. You know, we kind of know how to achieve plasma stability for these kinds of uh, regimes. Um, but only, why only six seconds? Um, and that's because the coils that JET was built with were resistive. So the coils would just overheat in six seconds. That was the only reason why we had to stop the experiments. 
Um, another alternative that you might have hear, heard about in the news is the National Ignition Facility in the US. Um, this was operated by um, Lawrence uh, Livermore um, National Lab. Um, the way this works is they have banks, like buildings full of high-powered lasers aimed at a spherical chamber. Um, and what you do is you place a near-perfect near sphere of frozen deuterium tritium uh, suspended in a capsule in the middle of that and you use 500 terawatt uh, la lasers for about five power, powers of lasers for about five nanoseconds um, to fire that into the, the deuterium tritium pellet. Um, the chamber, which is called the whole realm, which is contained in, is specially designed so that it converts that laser energy into X-rays, and those X-rays cause an implosion in the fuel, uh, making it about, you know, goes from about the density of water to about the density uh, of 100 times of lead um, in an instant, uh, and it, that generates uh, fusion, and, and you can see that they have actually managed to achieve um, uh, last year, in fact, a uh, fusion uh, gain of greater than one, which means which means they achieve more uh, power out than in, but at the fuel. Um, so when, when, I say, when I show this, I, I, I mean be careful around Q, because Q is the ratio of uh, energy out to energy in, uh, but at the fuel. It's not the total net energy. Um, so typically you need a Q of greater than 10 to have any shot at actual net power or energy to the grid. So we know how to do it. Um, uh, in experiments, um, but we haven't actually fully done it yet because they're actually really expensive to do, and we know how to do it because um, uh, both experimentation and calculations have shown that uh, fusion power scales with the fifth power of major radius of, of your machine for tokamaks and fourth power of magnetic field. So you use bigger magnets and make it bigger, then it's very likely you build to get to a place where you actually have a self-sustaining uh, self plasma. So here's why fusion engineering is hard. Um, it's not because of the, you know, we don't know how to do it. We do, um, as long as you spend the money. However, the engineering uh, limitations and challenges are really exciting, uh, really cool, but also really hard. Um, so if you're into difficult engineering, this is the field to be in. Um, so for example, radiation. So yes, fusion produces radiation, and it produces some radioactive waste. Um, but it's not at all like fission products. So the, the products tend to be much shorter-lived. And the reason is, the neutron that I was talking about before, when you're bombarding materials with that, that displaces atoms in your material, so you have a nice crystalline lattice of metal, perfect metal. The moment you put it into a fusion reactor, it starts knocking holes in it, um, and it becomes, you know, here's, here's some samples on the right-hand side. Both start as identical samples, um, but the right one's been uh, uh, absorbing neutron radiation, and as a result, it's grown. You can imagine as, as an engineer trying to design things that grow in operation. Um, uh, the other thing it does is it tends to transmute your materials. So the neutrons are absorbed by the elements in your, whatever you put into your reactor, um, and you get um, basically all sorts of random isotopes uh, being produced of all the elements that you put into your reactor. And so uh, what happens is they, they become radioactive, short-term radioactive, um, and it produces this material which is kind of known as tokamakium, um, which is this random mix of random radioactive elements that tends to coat and gum up all the inside of the reactor. So that's very difficult. <coughs> um, we need robotic maintenance because the extreme radiation due to the transmutation effects inside the reactor are very difficult. Um, so we need robots. So this is an example of one that we were operating on the, on the jet machine. Um, you need to be able to squeeze them into small spaces in high radiation environments, um, optimize them for speed and accuracy because power plant downtime is really bad. Um, this particular one is teleoperated, but you can imagine using machine learning and AI to control them automatically and so on. Um, the reactor vessels are walls, um, so you have to operate all of this in extremely hard vacuum in order to keep the plasma hot. If you put impurities into it, it will very quickly radiate your, away your energy, it becomes very inefficient. Um, so you need to have everything in, in high vacuum. Um, you also need some wall armor to withstand all the heat that's coming from the plasma. Um, typically you get about one megawatt per meter squared onto your tiles uh, in, inside, which is about you know, similar to the inside of a combustion or a jet engine. Um, so you know, we explore, basically a lot of fusion engineering and materials science and fusion engineering is exploring the periodic table for things that might happen to work in your fusion conditions. Um, so we look at tungsten, graphite, uh, vanadium, zirconium, you know, whatever you can find in the periodic table that will work. Um, and of course you also have, have to withstand neutron radiation. So um, you want materials that don't, for example, swell massively when they're exposed to neutrons. Um, here's an example of the toroidal field magnets. You can see they're absolutely massive, there's a person for scale. Um, they are made of, so ITER, um, which is in the south of France, uh, is, is being constructed, uh, possibly the, probably the biggest uh, fusion construction project at the moment. 
uses niobium tin superconduct superconductors. So you want your magnets to be superconducting as much as possible. That means basically they have zero resistance. Um, and uh, you need, in order to produce these, uh, ITER itself, uh, just for the one machine, had to ramp up global production of niobium tin from 15 to 100 tons a year. Um, they're extremely expensive, probably the most exp expensive part of the Tokamak. Um, you can see this, you know, it's absolutely massive. It's about 9 points by 17 meters in size, that one. Um, uh, in addition, um, I'll explain a bit more about superconductors actually. So, um, the superconductors act like frictionless flywheels, flywheels uh, effectively. So, if you pump in current, they will just keep on going. So, you can basically take away your power supply and they'll keep on going and they'll have that magnetic field basically frozen in place. But in order to do that, they need to be cryogenically cooled to about 4 degrees Kelvin, that's 4 degrees above absolute zero, in order to operate in that superconducting regime with enough field strength for us to get the fusion conditions that we want. Um, so the cryo plant, that's this uh, image here with all the dewars and pipes, to cool the coolant for the magnets in itself is a huge undertaking. Um, and uh, I think you, know, you have to do it in staged uh, units, use combinations of helium and liquid nitrogen and so on. Uh, I've got to speed up. Um, uh, fueling, um, we, we need to inject uh, DT ice pellets typically um, at, at about uh, 11 Kelvin, again, very close to absolute zero. Um, but they're nearly instant, you want to get them into the core for the fueling. So they're nearly instantaneously heated to 100 million degrees Kelvin. Uh, you need to inject them at about you know, one kilometer ish a second at about five hertz. Um, that's, again, it's like an ice machine gun. Um, heating current drive, you need to heat the plasma. So you typically use hundreds of megawatts of energy, um, and you use, there are various mechanisms you can do this with. Um, one example, for example, is a, a microwave injection. So very simple to do home microwave, but on orders of magnitude larger. Um, and of course, you need to inject that through a window somehow because you can keep your vacuum. So what we use is synthetically grown diamond windows uh, around you know, seven centimeters ish in diameter. ITER has about 60 of them. They take about six months to grow-ish. Um, and, and we use that to inject power into the plasma. Uh, here's an example of, of those windows. Um, right, I'm going to skip forward uh, through to, okay, so what are we going to be doing about it? So be wary of expectations. Um, everyone expects that it's going to be rivaling like already established and grown, um, you know, uh, very well-developed technologies like fusion, like, like uh, solar and like fission, um, but we're just trying to build the first car, right? So this is actually what we're going to try and do. Um, but even that is arguably the most yeah. difficult technical challenge I think mankind has ever embarked upon. Um, here's what Europe's doing. Uh, no, there are hundreds of machines globally, uh, both private and government sponsored. Um, for example here, they're currently building uh, ITER. Um, these are international collaborations. That's in south of France. The next one after that is going to be DEMO. ITER is going to try and demonstrate Q at 10. And that's it, it's not trying to, going to try and generate useful power. Demo is going to try and generate useful power. But in the UK, we're going to basically try and do our own as well. So um, we're going to build our own machine. The UK government's going to, um, you know, UK government is undertaking this, taking it very seriously. And our aim is to deliver significant net power from fusion, about 100 megawatts is what we're aiming for. I personally think about it as the UK's, effectively, our Apollo program. Um, and this is the program I've been involved in for the last four years. Um, this, is the, uh, this is our goal, deliver a UK prototype fusion energy plant targeting 2040 and a path to commercial viability of fusion. Um, so when people say, when do we want fusion? When are we going to get it? Um, probably about 20 years, right? But actually, <laughs> actually, I think this is one of the most exciting times to be in fusion because there is so much going on right now and we're actually taking this very seriously. So um, I'll skip forward. We have a site um, in, in uh, West Burton, we're going to be constructing there. Um, we're currently going, undergoing site preparation. Currently the project is, is in concept phase. Here is the current state of our concept. Um, we're hard at work on the design and we're targeting start of construction a few years, uh, you know, in 2030s. Um, so yeah, I think I'm probably out of time there, but uh, two minutes. Oh, fantastic. I can talk more about it. Um, Right, so what we're building, more, more details about what we're building. So we're building what's known as a spherical tokamak. So uh, on the right-hand side is EU demo, and that's more traditional donut shape. What happens is if you try and squish that all together, um, try and make it more compact, um, it becomes sort of more like a cord out apple, which is what you see on the left, more, more like spherical. And that design gives you much better confinement, um, and it gives you potentially lower cost because you've got a smaller plant. But it, obviously that's associated with challenges, because if you look in the middle, you know, you've got no space for your solenoid, you've got no space for all your, your conduits and so on. So it becomes much more challenging in certain engineering aspects. Um, but we already have experience with operating spherical tokamaks. We have one operating called MASTU in the UK AEA in Cullum. Um, 
And this is what we're going to do with the stamp machine. So we're going to try and generate meaningful net power. We're going to generate our own fuel so we don't have to keep buying it. Um, we're going to demonstrate effectively indefinite plasma stability, which is effectively on the order of hours, but we'll see, we don't know yet, um, but effectively demonstrate indefinite. Um, we need to demonstrate that it's going to be maintainable, because as I said, with neutron flux and so on, it becomes very difficult to maintain this, the integrity of your materials, so how are we going to maintain that in radioactive environments? Um, and the most important part, arguably, is that we're going to create an industry in the UK, and potentially globally, for uh, fusion technologies and fusion materials and supply chain. And we're going to try and stimulate industry and the economy in order to do this. Um, so yes, that's my talk, thank you.